The Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park in the Bahamas is one of the oldest marine protected areas in the world, a man-made sanctuary in the sea. The waters teem with life from the smallest to the largest creature in the food chain because they are protected from the most efficient predator our oceans have ever known. Where do you, well, I, I reckon if you fish off that point, cast yeah. it. Cast a fly, straight out. Oh, what, what, what's that? Probably a bat. Look, there. Hey, hey, hey. Look. Rupert, there's fish here. I came into this because in a very small and very limited way, I was a hunter of fish. My first salmon, my first salmon also the largest I ever caught. Here we come. On a Welsh river, 23 pounds. I was chuffed to bits to catch that. Whew, huge fin. I have never been more proud of myself. It was the last that anybody caught on that beat for years and years. I don't think anybody's caught one as big as that since. And I was triumphant, but I also have felt guilty about that fish ever since because it was one of the last of a spring run that now no longer happens. Now, why were fewer of them coming back? Well, I didn't know, but I thought I'd better find out. And that's really what set me off on this journey to find out what was happening to fish in the sea. It's Clover, Charles Clover. I've got some queries. Sir? What is the tuna that you serve? <laughs> Which ocean is it from and how is it caught? As a journalist, what changed my view of the sea is when I walked into the wrong press conference in The Hague in 1990. And this was the first presentation I'd ever seen about the effect of trawling upon the seabed and upon the creatures that lived on it. And what they said was that trawling with a beam trawler was like ploughing a field seven times a year. And I'm a farmer's son, and I thought to myself, how, mo how many crops would grow if you ploughed that field seven times a year? And I thought, not very much at all. And that changed my whole view of what was going on in the sea. Our view of the sea has always been that it is huge, beautiful, and inexhaustible.
The oceans are the common heritage of all mankind. And for billions of years, they have been full of life. These huge resources, these that we once believed to be renewable, that our whole human history has led us up to now to believe that are renewable, are not renewable anymore because of what we're doing to them. And so our, our entire philosophical approach has to change. It's not going to be the same in the future as it was in the past. That's where we are now. We never used to think about where our fish came from, but in fact, they are wild animals. And we found that out to our cost for the first time in Newfoundland. For centuries, the waters in northern Canada teemed with unbelievable amounts of codfish. Legend had it that you could walk across their backs on the water. The cod was so plentiful, the communities thrived on fishing. As the years went on, technology improved. The boats got bigger and catches increased. The bounty seemed endless. Then, in 1992, the unthinkable happened. In St. John's tonight, angry fishermen vented their rage. They charged the room where John Crosby was holding a news conference, but security would not let them in. What had once been the most abundant cod population in the world had been fished out of existence. I've decided that effective at midnight tonight, there will be a moratorium and harvesting of northern cod until the spring of 1994. Either we cooperate in addressing it, or there's going to be no fish for anybody. No fish for the Europeans, no fish for the Canadians, and an ecological catastrophe on our hands. With or without you, no, gonna... with or without you, You're and not only me, every fisherman on this island, we're going fishing. Overnight, 40,000 people lost their jobs. The cod is gone, and I think within the context of cod, particularly in the Canadian perspective, is that this is a species that has been fished for centuries and centuries. Cod was the reason that people migrated from the UK, from Europe, northern France in particular, to Canada. It was because of cod. The fishing ban brought the people to the streets. They hoped that one day the cod would return. The significance didn't drop, didn't dawn on anybody, till much later. Today, there are uh, so few left that they're, uh, they've got endangered status in Canada, and the cod populations have not rebounded despite a moratorium on cod fishing since 1992. In 2007, this research vessel set two lines, each with 1,500 hooks, to find out how many cod were left in the waters off eastern Canada. On the first line, they caught one small codfish. On the second, a small basketful. The cod stocks had been depleted to such a low level that they were unable to recover. For Newfoundland, for a community for which the whole reason for its existence was cod, there's this historical ingrained element. It's part of society, permeates society, and the loss of the fish was basically akin to sort of a loss of soul, and it still remains that 15 years later. After the collapse of the cod, a new breed of fishery scientists started to investigate what had been happening to all the fish in every ocean of the world. Local catches of fish had been declining almost everywhere. 
But what puzzled the scientists in 2001 was that the total world catch kept going up and up. It didn't make sense. The concerns that people had expressed that local stocks were going down everywhere, but that uh, global statistics were showing an increase, that this was a discrepancy. Daniel Pauley, a leading expert in global fishing, was asked by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization to investigate this mystery. Daniel Pauley had the brilliance to start examining why, in the face of the evidence that you saw in front of you locally, and in the face of, of, of evidence like Newfoundland, that the figures kept going up. It was when Pauli and his colleagues looked at the reported catches from China that they found their answer. For every part of the world, the reporting was right, except for Chinese waters. When uh, Daniel Pauli came to this department and he said, I think they're wrong. I said, what do you mean they're wrong? He said, well, it can't be that China's catching that much. And they found that Actually, when you looked at the biological productivity of the sea and what we know about it everywhere else, the Chinese figures could not be right. They were just made up. They were made up by communist officials who only got preferment if the graphs went up. Graphs kept going up because they kept making up the figures. And it was a huge seismic moment. We concluded that they were so bad upward, so much, that uh, if you corrected for this effect, the world catch would not be increasing, but decreasing. For the first time in human history, the future of the food the world gets from the sea was in doubt. Sent a shiver down my spine because that was the one thing that a lot of people were holding on to, well, things may be bad, but at least we're catching lots and we're catching more every year, so you know, it can be that bad. From about 1988, we now realize um, it was on the way down. And we only figured that out in 2002. All of these things were like warning signals, and they were telling a story in aspects. This is a story that was going on at the same time as the human influences elsewhere, but it's been told late. It's been told we haven't had so much time to do something about it. Now it's on us. And now, in the next maybe 40, 50 years, it's crisis, it's crash, it's do something about it time. And that's why this is arguably one of the biggest problems in the world. Man has been hunting fish in the sea since he discovered they were there. Three thousand years, these men and their forefathers have expected giant bluefin tuna to migrate from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. And every spring, the fishermen set their trap, an ancient method of fishing known as the almadrava.
The Almadraba fishermen once used to catch thousands of bluefin. But over the last 10 years, their catches have declined by Porque yo también quisiera que a lo mejor. On the other side of the world, in Canada, scientist Boris Worm had been trying to work out how many tuna and other large fish were left in the sea. Somebody said counting fish is just as easy as counting trees, just that they're invisible and they move. So it's, a, it's an almost impossible thing to do, especially when you want to assess how the global ocean has changed, the whole thing. We asked that very simple question, where are we now relative to a baseline that we set around 1950, because large-scale industrial fishing started around 1950. So here in 1952, when this series starts, we see that around Japan, there's already blue colors dominating, meaning that the catch rates were low, around one fish per hundred hooks. In areas that were newly exploited, we see catch rates about 10 times higher, um, 10 or more fish per hundred hooks. Worm used Japanese fishing fleet data that had recorded how many fish were caught on every hundred hooks they set. This is the first time uh, industrial longline fisheries went out into the open ocean and just worked through the whole ecosystem. fishery has reached a truly global coverage and a lot of the ocean is in the blue colors now meaning the abundance of these large fish globally has probably declined by about 90 percent. This has been widely criticized and um, there have been many papers written to undermine and attack these findings. Totally wrong. That's, there's just no question that's totally wrong. Some fishery scientists felt that worms findings didn't reflect their local situation. Some thought that even attempting to count how many large fish were left in all the oceans was an impossible task. I think that in their haste to get the big picture, they, they don't look carefully enough at, at local places. They actually disagree with one thing, certain tuna, yellowfin, and skipjack in the Pacific. And there they say it's only 70%, not 90%. Whether it's 90 or 95 or 80 or 70 is rather irrelevant. We all know they've declined dramatically. So focusing on the particulars in that, in that sense 
is, is not helpful. The overall trends in worms' findings were reflected in official data. Species after species had collapsed. Everybody recognizes that there's major problems in the world's fisheries. And, uh, and at one level, it's a question of how, you know, of how bad is it. Today, in every ocean of the world, high-tech industrial vessels are hunting down every known edible species of fish. The basic problem in most fisheries that are in trouble is too, too many boats. Too much capacity chasing too few fish. Global fishing capacity could catch the world catch four times over. The world's long-lining industry sets 1.4 billion hooks every year. These are estimated to be set on enough line to encircle the globe more than 550 times. The mouth of the largest trawling net in the world is big enough to accommodate 13 747s. We are fighting a war against fish, right? And we are throwing at them our industry and we are winning. And that's how we perceive our interaction with them. It's a fight. The thing is we're too good right now. Technologically, not a single hunted animal on this earth has a chance. These vessels are equipped with uh, so much electronic equipment that they, the fish have absolutely no chance of escaping. The skipper knows exactly where he is in relationship to a rock where fish could hide, in relationship to a wreck where fish will be attracted to. It doesn't take very long for us to have very serious consequences in what we're doing. We're not willing, we keep pressing the button, we're not willing to hold back. The might of the fishing armory has grown exponentially in the last 50 years. The amount of fishing power that we have at our command today far outweighs uh, our ability to control ourselves. Fishing has transformed entire ecosystems. In fact, I would say one of the largest scale transformation of the uh, planetary environment has been the impact of bottom trawlers. Nets that are dragged across the seabed and as they are pulled they, they cut down the animals that live on the surface, things like corals and sea fans and sponges. But the signs of destruction brought up on deck by the trawl would make an angel weep. If fishing effort uh, continued to increase, continued to be directed at uh, dwindling resource, you would of course catch most of it. The bluefin is one of the most iconic fish in the sea. Its beautiful hydrodynamic shape and specially heated blood allow it to accelerate faster than a supercar. Pound for pound, its delicious flesh is the most expensive and sought after on the planet. The bluefin once sustained Roman legions in battle. Now it feeds fashion conscious diners and sushi restaurants around the world. Bluefin is the front line. Bluefin is, is the most immediate crisis that we know about. 
For many years, scientists have been predicting that the king of the tuna would be hunted to extinction. But now, it is actually happening. Roberto Mielgo is a bluefin tuna fisherman who has turned whistleblower on an industry he believes is out of control. A lone presence in the ports of Europe, Mielgo is hunting for information to bring the slaughter to a halt. It's bluefin. I can, I can actually tell from here it's bluefin. I started in this business as a, as a tuna farm diver. That was many years ago. Those days were the good old days, where the stock was healthy, I would say. But then uh, bluefin tuna became big business. I mean, really big business. In 2002, I was in Tunisia, I think it was. And that's when I first sensed that something terribly wrong was happening. The conflict was that I started something I could not control. And as from there, I took the decision to try and do the right thing. That is a bluefin uh, unloading. Let's say, let's say there's only two containers. And they jam pack those two reefer containers, 40 feet reefer containers with 28 tons each. That is 50, 56 tons of fish, which is more than what Taiwan would normally declare as catches at the end of the fishing season. So there you go. I mean, one boat. just one boat. Uh, what's at stake here is of an infamous minority of people making millions and millions and millions by decimating a species. Is that right? Is that moral? In Luxembourg, European Union ministers meet to decide the fate of the fish and the industry which depends on it. Fishing is supposed to be controlled through internationally agreed quotas, the amount fishermen are allowed to catch. These are recommended by scientists. What will happen this afternoon um, and what it will mean for the bluefin tuna well, what will happen is that uh, fisheries ministers of the EU will take a decision that goes against uh, any rational scientific advice for the conservation of bluefin. Bluefin scientists are recommending a catch of 15,000 tons simply to avoid collapse. In order to rebuild the fish population, the catch needs to be less, at 10,000 tons. But ministers vote for a catch of 29,500 tons, twice what it should be to keep the population from crashing, and three times what it should be to let the fish recover. I just can't accept that. This is a political quota. It's, it's, it's negotiating with biology, and you just can't do that and expect to see the biology survive. This is a species which is as endangered as the white rhinoceros, and yet it's being hunted to extinction in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's being exploited at more than twice the level as it should be, uh, and those countries that have overfished it are not being forced to pay back what they've overfished, so not a day in which the European Union has covered itself in glory. Bluefin tuna is not the only fish whose stocks have declined dramatically, and most of the others have declined while under the supervision of the scientists and politicians in the richest nations of the world. If fishery managers were engineers, they would have been fired long ago because uh, you know, we'd be having collapsing buildings and bridges all over the place because the calculations are so far out. And so it's not a question of if 
uh, fish stocks will collapse. Uh, when you make decisions like that, it's a question simply of when. Collapse is inevitable. This is the center of the bluefin tuna universe. Malta is that. Roberto Mielgo has come to Malta to investigate whether the tuna industry is catching more than the quota allows. Hello, Charles. How are you doing? How are you getting on? Oh, well, busy. <laughs> Have you found a lot? Uh, quite a lot, yes. Despite the scientists recommending an annual catch of 15,000 tons and the politicians setting 30,000 tons, official figures show that the Mediterranean bluefin tuna industry simply ignores the regulations and catches 61,000 tons, a third of the entire bluefin tuna population. Mielgo discovers that some fishermen will stop at nothing to get hold of this sought-after commodity. I flew to Lampedusa the other day, and um, just by chance I came across um, some interesting documents. Is there anything to, um, to link them to, um, uh, uh, to fishing activity? So they can catch as many fish as possible. The fleets use planes to spot the tuna shoals, an activity that has been outlawed during this part of the season for the last 10 years. Mostly these planes were operated by Italian uh, fishing fleets, fishing south of uh, Lampedusa, east of uh, Tunisia, and outside Libyan waters. This is a disgrace. The Italian government isn't doing a thing. Nobody is enforcing the rule of law. This is a disgrace for the European Union. The breaking of the rules by fishermen is one of the biggest problems facing the world's oceans. Illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is worth up to $25 billion a year. Fishermen cheat because they can. F fishermen cheat because they don't get caught. That's true of all systems. A study for the House of Lords in the United Kingdom reported that 50% of the cod caught in the North Sea was illegal. Every other fish on your plate was stolen, stolen from you. Mielgo has come to Tokyo the center of the world tuna trade, where last-ditch attempts are being made to save the majestic bluefin. The biggest company in the tuna business is the multinational Mitsubishi, makers of cars and electrical products. They don't actually catch the fish, they just buy it. I would think that Mitsubishi uh, Corporation itself would be in control of something like 60% of uh, all of the entire bluefin tuna production, uh, northern bluefin tuna production in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Mielgo is here to attend a meeting of the International Committee for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, ICAT, which has been called in a desperate attempt to persuade the industry to stick to internationally agreed quotas. Roberto speaking here in Tokyo. How are you getting on? Well, <laughs> it's been a humbling experience, Charles. 
Mielgo had discovered that Mitsubishi were sending out new, larger boats to bring back bluefin. They have pumped up their freezing and transportation capacity. Mitsubishi claimed to control less than 40% of the bluefin import market and say the new boats were sent to replace old vessels. But Mielgo believes that Mitsubishi and other traders are building up frozen reserves, which will be worth much more if fish stocks are depleted. If there's no more bluefin tuna caught, but you're sitting on 60, 70,000 tons of it frozen, you name the price. Mitsubishi say they try to provide the Japanese market with stable supplies at reasonable prices while supporting policies to ensure long-term sustainability of the stock. But Mielgo fears that the result will still be the extinction of the species. The immediate conclusion one has to come up to is that these guys want to fish until the very last bluefin tuna. Once they have caught the very last bluefin tuna, they will go on to big eye tuna, and once they have overfished uh, big eye tuna, they will go for another tuna species. Mitsubishi insists they want to preserve the tuna for future generations, and they support cuts in the bluefin quota. The fate of bluefin shows what multinational corporations, international fisheries policy, and consumer demand can do to a wild species. But the race to catch the last fish whatever its price, is happening all over the world. Hundreds of millions of people in the world depend on fish to keep them alive. For 1.2 billion people, it is a key part of their diet. In West Africa, which used to have one of the richest seas on the planet, the stocks of fish have declined massively in the last 50 years. Rashid Sumela, is an expert on West African fisheries who has come to Senegal to find out what effect this has had on local people. Fish is crucial in, in West Africa. I mean, the coastal people depend on fish, and even the interior people come down when the, when the farms disappoint them, when there's drought, deserts, and so on. So it is very important to keep this going for the sake of the people, because if the fish goes down, the coast of West Africa will be littered with problems. We, we cannot afford to let this go. Adama Mbergo is an artisanal fisherman who lives in Dakar, the capital of Senegal. Fishing is his livelihood. Just on the level of the Kuramula, Hunger at Japujan, 
ak dugg sa kër fek ma ndawal lu baax lek bu suur xam nga ñun suñuy morom suñuy morom dañ daan joge ñom seen kër ñom seen baax intellectuel la da daan lek ci jamono joy suñu maami man lima joto fekke dañ daan ñew manam biñ doon wax nax na daal code bi yaatna ci bor ibni suñu maami daan ñew di japp jën bu bari ñun ci tek suñu bëtt ñun loolu mo ñu korompu tay ñu yaakar ñun bu ñu juddo ba magg da nga na gis ko xamanteni sax papam today adama earns 6 dollars from his fishing his fuel cost him 4 what is left has to feed his family. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the same shoreline, money is being made. The governments of many developing countries trade fishing rights for quick cash from developed nations. Taxpayers from the Western world pay for the largest fishing boats on the planet super trawlers to fish the distant waters. The locals and their pirogues don't stand a chance. That's no good for the fishermen. That's no good for our sea. That's good just for European fishermen and government Senegal because he have a lot of money. Haidar has dived the waters off Senegal for the last 35 years and has witnessed huge changes to the health of the local ocean. He is campaigning against foreign boats fishing in his waters. When I see this, I want to fight with this guy. I want to fight with this industrial boat. I want to fight with the government who take just money and don't know what to do. I want to fight with the world because the world's going to be to be dead. It's not possible. Fishing is one of the most wasteful practices on earth. Every year, more than seven million tons, a tenth of the world's catch, goes back over the side dead. This includes hundreds of thousands of turtles, seabirds, sharks, whales, and dolphins. See how he do to destroy the ocean. He take just what he want. He take just what he need to sell now. But, but the fish, he don't need to sell that. He put him out and he killed them. Look, all around you. As the fish have been taken by foreign fleets, fishermen like Adama have been left with an impossible decision. Should he leave his family and risk the dangerous journey to Europe? The fish goes, the people are made poorer, and what happens? They try to immigrate. The Europeans like our fish, but they don't like the people. The fish has visa to come in, but the people are turned back. Uh, man is not going to change 
and the sea going to be dead because man is crazy. We are crazy. Our our, our world is crazy world. <laughs> Restaurants of Asia, diners are buying live fish in greater quantities than ever before. These are being taken from the most beautiful parts of the planet, the Coral Triangle. The Coral Triangle is an area of ocean half the size of the United States in the seas of Southern Asia. Coral reefs were targeted as a food supply when local waters ran out. The most desirable fish are the reef's large, colorful predators. Our insatiable appetite for such delicacies threatens to tip the fragile balance of nature into chaos. We don't know what the implications are of losing some of these very, um, one particular component of the ecosystem. We just know that in other ecosystems there have been problems and that when we mess around with nature, there's usually problems. On the east coast of America, there is a terrifying clue of what can happen when you disturb the ocean's natural equilibrium. We've got a big surprise for you. We've got a Chesapeake Ray. Most people don't use it as a food because it's a little difficult to get to. In Chesapeake Bay, there have been increasing reports of a plague of biblical proportions. A little known inhabitant of the bay, the cow nose ray, has exploded in numbers. Local scientist Pete Peterson was investigating the increase in the cow-nosed ray population when he noticed that the graph of their growth was the exact opposite of the graph of the decline in their main predator, the shark. Even a number of quality scientists will tell you that, uh, that statistics are in some ways icing on the cake when you do your science. But to tell you the truth, as you look at a plot of how the numbers of sharks along this coast have changed, how the numbers of rays, skates, and smaller sharks have changed at the same time, you don't need a statistic at all. It jumps right off the page at you. When large predators are taken out, when they're depleted in abundance as much as they are, um, we have large ecosystem effects that can um, cause all sorts of domino effects throughout the ecosystem. Um, a lot of them surprising, unforeseen effects. There's evidence of this knock-on effect happening all over the world. In Newfoundland, lobster numbers are exploding. The loss of cod and other bottom-dwelling fishes, what we have seen is an increase in the abundance of other things. Um, so in this part of the Atlantic, there's always been a fair number of lobster, but there's now evidently quite a bit more. So it seems fairly reasonable to conclude that the decline of cod and other predatory fishes has um, basically paved the way for an increase in the abundance of those things that cod used to eat. Fishermen have eagerly fed off the bonanza. There is big money to be made in lobster, but how long will it last? This is the situation that happens uh, everywhere we have removed the fish, the large fish. Uh, in many places, what has exploded is the shrimp. Shrimp have exploded. It's good shrimp, good money, but if you fish them, what then? The end point is when the prawns and the scallops too have gone. We, we, we really will be down to 
a highly simplified ecosystem of mud and worms. Jellyfish infestations are increasing. Beaches are becoming no-go zones. Our oceans, once full of large fish, are now filling up with algae, plankton, and worms. Plankton sticks pressed into fish-shaped pieces, perhaps. Uh, jellyfish burgers. Uh, the, the options are endless. We're losing species, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for society? What does it mean for the predictability of the global oceans, which is 70% of the planet? And the answer is, with every species that disappears, some of those services are eroding. There's less food, there's declining water quality, and there's declining stability of the system. What alarmed me the most was that the ability of the system to absorb shocks and disasters, to deal with climate change, to deal with overfishing, was diminishing. Uh, it could be a, a road of no return. According to data collected by the United Nations, the number of fish species whose populations have crashed is growing year by year. Worm and the other scientists have projected that if the current trends continue, the stocks of fish which we now eat will have collapsed by the middle of the century. What we noticed was the curves, that were, they were separating the high and low diversity curves, but they were both dropping. All the fish and invertebrates that we eat, that supply us with seafood, um, we found that by 2003, about one third of them were in what we call collapsed state. Over the last 50 years, there was a very, very clear trend of year after year after year more of these species were in that collapse category. They started very high, they kept dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping, and if you take those curves and you say, well, they're dropping, when are they gonna hit zero? When are they gonna drop down to the point where the fisheries that we're used to are no longer gonna be possible? Uh, and those curves drop down and they hit zero about 2048. This is not some horror scenario, it's a real possibility, and it's not rocket science because if we're depleting one species after another, it's a finite resource, there will be a point in the future where we will run out if we don't change the way we treat this global resource. Worm and the others were criticized by their opponents for naming a precise date, but this was not the point they were making. Whoever makes an extrapolation makes it always assuming that things remain the same. And I would say that assuming that things remain the same, this prediction that we will have no fish in, uh, in 50 years or so are essentially correct. When the human population comes under real pressure on land, when we begin to have real problems from global warming, when we r start running out of uh, enough food to feed ourselves, um, we have just squandered one of the greatest resources that we've ever had on the planet, wild fish. That's what it means. For generations, men have hunted the world's oceans. For generations, we have eaten fish. What can our generation do to stop us reaching the end of the line? 
Today, my son doesn't like. If I cook fish, he said, "No, mommy, I want chicken." And I said, "Fish is good for the body." He said, "No." Well, I love fish. Hundred, hundred and two percent. Well, I love to eat fish. <laughs> I am. So fish are uh, fish are food to me. Lots of the time people say, well, the, all the fish, 90% of the fish gone. Where are they? Well, we have eaten them. That's what we have. We have eaten them. When we look at a piece of fish on our plate, what do we know about that fish? We know it's good for us. We know it's probably got some omega-3 fatty acids, which are good for all our organ functions. But what else do we know about it? What do we know about it? Do we know what species it is even? Do we know whether it was caught legally or illegally, or in the waters of some distant country where the inhabitants would actually prefer to have caught it themselves? Hello, Ingrid. Uh, it's Charles Clover from the Daily Telegraph. I noticed that marlin was on the menu. This is a kind of an unusual fish to find on the menu. And I wondered um, which species of marlin this was, because I thought there wasn't an awful lot of marlin left. Both these fish, the bluefin tuna and the uh, Chilean sea bass, are listed as endangered species. Um, I wanted to talk to someone who would know about uh, the sourcing policy for fish at Nobu restaurants. Can we send them an email? No, we can't. British journalist Charles Clover has been trying to find out what is sold in some of the most exclusive restaurants of the world. After five years of no comment, eventually Nobu agreed to talk. Hello. Hello, Mr. Clover. How are you? Hello, Mr. Notar. How are you? I feel like I know you. <laughs> We've got a, a fish that has actively been described as endangered since 1996. And you're serving it in your restaurants. Not only are we going to describe what it is on the menu, I'm going to put an asterisk next to it. And on the bottom of the, of the menu, I'm going to say, you know, it is an endangered, uh, an, uh, environmentally uh, endangered species. Just so people know. That's the first immediate step that we can do. Then we also... It's a sort of hard sell. You know, here's some endangered species. Are, are people going to buy that, do you think? Well, I mean, you know, you're boxing me into a corner. You, at, at one point, people are saying you're not being informative. At some point, people have to make decisions on their own. If you look at a pack of cigarettes, it has warning signs say this will kill you. The, the, the question people will want to know is why you just don't take it off the menu now. If you've got orangutans and, you know, cheetahs and lions and tigers and things on that menu, I mean, people would, you know, be, be walking away. There'll be a huge scandals. There'll be tabloid stories about it. People would be execrated. People, there would be turds on people's doorsteps and in envelopes being shoved through them. People would, you know, burn each other's houses down, scratch through their cars. And yet, we're doing it to things in the sea. And we're doing the same thing. This dish is modern, cool, uh, refreshing, looks really, really like flashy, um, but it's dead, dead simple. So I've got some beautiful bluefin tuna. Now that these kind of popular television programs with celebrity chefs have made fish fashionable, is it too late to save the world's oceans? People ask me all the time, are you despairing or are you hopeful? And I say, I'm absolutely hopeful. And they ask, what makes you think that? And I say, well, two things. One is, uh, now we have a much better understanding than even five years ago of what's going on. And there's a track record of when we 
uh, understood changes and they became uh, public knowledge. They entered people's consciousness. Um, like with pollution, like with ozone depletion, with climate change more recently, um, things started to happen and people made changes. I think that there's a, a message of hope because there's still time for us to turn the course of history. And uh, uh, although the, the uh, players have taken poison, there's still time to save them. Alaska is on the front line in the battle to conserve fish. According to the UN, according to the only laws that we have of the sea, the sea belongs to us, the citizen. Not to the fishermen, not to the aggregates industry, not to the oil and gas industries. It's ours. So why don't we claim it back? Alaska has a 200-mile fishing limit, which it strictly enforces. Portlock Bank, uh, coordinates are going to be 56. It appears that they've been fishing in one area and they're claiming another. One of the lessons from Alaska is first you have to not allow new boats to enter and you have to find mechanisms to get some boats to leave to, to match your fleet size to the capacity of the resource. Alaska's fishing policy is not perfect, but the number of fishing boats here is carefully controlled, and managers can monitor how much is being caught and react accordingly. Fishing policy here is determined by the science. Catch limits are set well below the level that fish populations can withstand. One of the differences between Alaska and let's say the North Sea or is that the average exploitation rate on stocks in Alaska is on the order of 10% a year. In, in, in the North Sea, it's 50%. One way in which Alaska controls the catch is by giving the fishermen a limited amount of time to fulfill their quota. perspective sometimes that's there's a personal sacrifice but if you look at it from the big picture you got to take a cut in the harvest but you take that knowing that it gives you an opportunity to, to maybe have a better season two three four five years from now we just don't want to catch that fish this year or next year we want to catch it 10 15 20 years from now as consumers we have the power to bring about a positive change at sea by demanding to know where our fish comes from, how it was caught, and whether it is in danger. There is a fishing industry out there, some of which is trying incredibly hard to get it right. And they are not being supported as much as they should be because people are not recognizing the difference between what they're doing and what the guys who are just rampantly raping the seas are doing. I think we have to support that part of the fishing industry. For consumers, there are guides to identifying which fish is better to eat. Then there are labels which certify its sustainability. One is issued by the Marine Stewardship Council, the MSC. What we do and the choices we make in, say, supermarkets when we go to a restaurant actually has a direct effect on marine diversity. At the moment, only a small proportion of the fish we buy comes from a sustainable source. But with pressure, things are slowly changing. Even the world's largest retailer, Walmart, 
has plans to sell only MSC fresh and frozen fish by 2011. We sell approximately 20 million pounds of fresh fish a year. We had to do something that would protect us as we grow and as we need more and more product into the future. And that's where the, the MSC really shone out to us as a, a, a leading way that we can really embrace and grow our business. Bird's Eye, once the king of the codfish finger, now buys over two thirds of their fish from sustainable sources. And fast food outlet McDonald's say that over 90% of their fish comes from a sustainable source. Knowledge is power, and what knowledge gives you is the opportunity to change the way that you do things, to change the way you behave. More and more fish are now being farmed. Many people see this as an answer to the increasingly desperate problem facing our oceans. But fish farming is not all that it seems. Fish farming uses wild fish to feed farmed fish, but it kills more than it produces. All of these anchovies will be ground up for fish meal to feed fish and other animals around the world. Of the 100 million tons that get fished every year in the planet, 40% go and get ground into fish meal to feed other fish and not to feed people. So that some rich people somewhere in the world can eat salmon and can eat shrimp. The more fish farming we do in the West, the less fish we have. This is one of the paradoxes that people have big have problems understanding. Aquaculture for species that eat fish doesn't have that much room to grow because there just aren't that many fish out there in the ocean to feed them anymore. You actually convert fish from one species into the other. You don't make more fish, at least not when you have farmed fish. On average, five kilos of anchovy make only one kilo of salmon. We've reached the buffers. We have reached the limits of what the ocean is capable of providing to feed the fish farming industry. So how can it grow if it's already reached the end of its feedstock? Patricia has started a campaign to encourage people all over the world to eat small fish like anchovy, herring, and mackerel instead of the farm fish that are fed on them. Why not eat the fish directly? Why not eat the anchovies? They're much better for you than salmon anyways. It's this tiny little fish that has all the energy that you need to, 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 to be healthy. If fish farming is not the answer, despite attempts to make it less wasteful. And sustainable fisheries aren't catching on fast enough. What else can we do to save the world's oceans? We need to turn back the clock 200 years to bring back life, to restore its previous abundance and productivity in some places around the world oceans. I'm talking about creating a network of areas within which we can turn back the clock. It's a nice country. You know, it can't be no beautiful than this. Outside you die and go to heaven. Marine reserves are areas of the world's oceans where commercial fishing is completely banned. The results can be staggering. Wherever people have established an area that's off limits to fishing and uh, policed it well, they've been resolute in their pursuit of protection. Reserves have shown marvelous benefits. I studied marine reserves in the Caribbean and there the local communities set up four areas that were off limits to fishing in 1995 
Over time, you could see the reef repopulating and refilling, and uh, life was becoming more abundant on them. And we, we saw an increase of uh, three, four, five times uh, the amount of fish that were present initially over a period of uh, seven years of protection after that. Hardy McKinney is a fisherman in South Andros in the Bahamas, campaigning for a reserve to be set up in an area decimated by fishing. Have this area set aside as a, a protected area. No one is permitted to go here to fish. And you allow the fish to do what they, what they do. It's just a natural thing. You would have more fish. So you would go to a rock where there's one Nassau grouper. And next year, you may see two. And then the following year, you may see four. And so, you know, it, it, naturally it would work. Marine reserves are absolutely necessary, but they are necessary and we must have lots of them. The best available calculation on uh, how much it will cost to have a global network of marine protected areas that would cover between 20 and 30 percent of the area of the world oceans is that it would, it would take about 12 to 14 billion dollars a year uh, to manage a network of that scale. Compared to fishery subsidies, the, the amount is roughly equivalent. Um, the uh, fishery subsidies are estimated to be of the order of about 15 to 30 billion dollars a year. Uh, and those subsidies encourage overfishing. What this 12 to 14 billion dollar cost of managing protected areas would do would be to contribute to the solution to overfishing. And in the process, would create about a million jobs worldwide. The world has signed up to establishing a network of marine protected areas by 2012. Some nations have promised to protect 20% or more of their seas in the future. But we have to put pressure on governments to ensure this happens. We have about 4,000 marine reserves of different sizes in the world. They cover one less than 1% of the world ocean, 0.6. 99.4% of the ocean is fishable. You are allowed to fish in 99% of the ocean. Now that doesn't seem to me to be a proper representation of our interests as citizens. Marine reserves on their own will not solve the problem of the emptying seas. Fishermen and migratory fish will move to unprotected areas, so these also have to be controlled. Politicians have to act responsibly when making decisions about the oceans. Consumers need to change their eating habits. And the global fishing industry has to abide by the rules and reduce its capacity. The problem is getting political will to implement these things and uh, people will always argue, well, you can't do this because uh, it would affect too many people's livelihoods. Well, in, in the end, those livelihoods are disappearing year by year with inaction. I want them to manage the sea for recovery. I want, the, I want it to be full of fish. I want it to be full of cod and skate and haddock and halibut and, you know, shellfish and everything. Does society want to see that recovery take place? Or is it society happy with massive depletions? I don't think my six-year-old daughter is going to be particularly happy in 10 years' time when she reads about this stuff and learns about it and says, God, all this happened in your lifetimes. In your lifetime, my lifetime. Anyone who's 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, this has happened on our watch, and we have a collective responsibility. The difference between this and other environmental problems is that actually it is relatively simple to solve. We can act now. It's not rocket science. We don't need more knowledge to do so. So let's do what we can where we can. You can do it here. You can do it now. You just do it.
Now there are three steps to heaven. Just listen and you will plainly see. And as life travels on and things do go wrong, just follow steps one, two, and three. Step one, you find a girlhood to love. Step two, she falls in love with you. Step three, you kiss and hold her tightly. Yeah, that sure seems like heaven to me. 